Thank you, honorable members. Please be seated. Honorable members, we will now proceed with the second reading of the representation of the People Amendment Bill 2022, Bill Number 24 of 2022, published on the 1st of November 2022. The Honorable Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs. Mr. Speaker and honorable members of this house, I rise to move that the representation of the People Amendment Bill, Bill number 22, Bill number 24 of 2022, be read for the second time. Mr. Speaker, this bill and the one that will immediately succeed it are two of the most important pieces of legislation that we will be discussing perhaps in the next few years as they seek to enhance, modernize, and reform the democratic polity and architecture of our country and in particular, to make our electoral machinery, our registration process of citizens, and the compilation of the list of electors more transparent, more, ac more accountable, and more effective. Mr. Speaker, the bill that is before us has been in the public domain for some time now and has been the subject of much public commentary. Therefore, no one in this house or by extension listening to this debate ought to be unfamiliar with the contents of this bill. But for the purpose of the record, it is important that I state that these amendments were immediately triggered by the unfortunate incidents which marred the 2020 March 2nd general and regional elections, where flagrant attempts were made to thwart the democratic will of the electorate, so much so that the head of the OAS mission to Guyana, a former prime minister of Jamaica, said that it was the most transparent attempts to alter the lawful results of an election that he has ever seen. Mr. Speaker, that precipitated our political party when we were in the opposition and then when we were declared the government to make three fundamental commitments through His Excellency President Dr. Mohammed Irfan Ali. Firstly, we promised these electoral reforms. Secondly, we promised that the investigative arm of the state will be activated and criminal charges will be instituted if there is evidence to support those charges. And thirdly, that a commission of inquiry will be launched under the hand of the president to inquire into the facts and circumstances surrounding the irregularities that took place subsequent to voting day in relation to those elections. The investigative arm has been activated as promised and there are currently pending before the criminal courts of our country some 32 charges against persons implicated 
in the alleged wrongdoings which we all witnessed. That is an ongoing process. So that's commitment number one delivered upon. Commitment number two is the commission of inquiry and that is also a work in progress. And now, Mr. Speaker, we are delivering on commitment number three, which are the legal reforms that we are proposing here tonight. Mr. Speaker, the road to this destination has been a long one. This bill and it, the bill that we will discuss subsequently enjoyed several rounds of consultations involving and engaging many important stakeholder organizations and receiving the inputs from those organizations. The bills themselves were sent out to various of these organizations and they were given ample and up, uh, an adequate time to scrupulously examine them and to submit their um, contributions to the bills. Those contributions were examined and taken on board where we considered, when it was considered necessary to do so. And then we concluded that consultative process with a grand consultation right here in the halls of this house where some over 100 persons emanating from various important stakeholder organizations were present and they benefited, Mr. Speaker, from a marathon five-hour engagement. Again, recommendations and submissions were taken on board and the bills benefited from them. Mr. Speaker, the first thing that I want to address is the state that our laws were in even before we began the amending process. Our electoral laws, unfortunately, have been passed over the last 25 to 30 years in a very piecemeal fashion. So you have several pieces of amendments scattered all over the legislative landscape, amending ROPA, amending the National Registration Act, and then we had the anomalous situation where we had a, a bill called Election Laws Amendment Bill or um, Election Laws Amendment Act that was passed in 2000 that presents itself as an amendment, but in fact, it was a principal act as there is no principal act in the country called an Election Laws Act. And that act became the cradle of a whole slew of important provisions relating to the Elections Commission, the electoral process, the powers of the Commission, the establishment of a permanent secretariat, the power of the Commission to take charge of that secretariat, the power of the Commission to hold the Chief Elections Officer answerable, the power of the Commission to hold the Chief Election Officer answerable even for the hiring of staff, the provision to make empower GCOM to deal with situations of emergency and difficulties after there is a recession of Parliament and there is no legislative body to intervene to make laws. All those wide and very crucial plenitude of powers were assembled in this one piece of legislation called the Election Laws Amendment Act. And then, as I said, the National Registration Act was amended several times when we introduced into our registration system the cyclical form of continuous registration, abolishing the acyclical form of registration which existed hitherto. And even that, when one reads the letter columns of the newspaper and hear the political narrative emanating from the opposition, one gets the distinct impression that there is great misunderstanding still yet in, in appreciating 
that we have a continuous cycle of registration. And that difficulty comes from the scattered and piecemeal way that our law finds itself currently now. Any person who has had the opportunity or the occasion to research our law would tell you the difficulty and the, the, the tedious nature of the exercise simply to find the law and then to understand which one um, impliedly or expressly repealed which one, which one have not been repealed and which have been repealed. Um, lawyers doing election cases and cases of a political nature have had the miserable ordeal of deciphering pages and pages of legislation. And then, of course, one had to find them in the first place. I recall distinctly when I was arguing the case in 2019 in relation to the then House to House registration process commenced by Chairman of the Elections Commission at that time, James Patterson, the Chief Justice of our country, the Honorable Madam Justice Roxanne George, expre ex expressed great disquiet at the state that the law was in because it was so difficult to assemble the various pieces of legislation and then to try to understand them in a coherent and chronological way. Half of them were overtaken by events because they were passed to meet peculiar events that would have been contemplated or expected to take place or to feature at a particular election time or a particular elections. And when that elections passed, that eventuality no longer existed, but that provision or those provisions remained on the statute book, creating unnecessary ammunition for lawyers who want to advance disingenuous arguments because the law is there and they use that to make clear positions ambiguous by injecting these different and varying and various pieces of legislation. What this exercise enabled us to do, Mr. Speaker, was to examine all this gamut of loose pieces of paper all over the landscape, to examine them scrupulously, dissect from them the irrelevant provisions, those that may have been overtaken by events, put aside those provisions that have been repealed, and to consolidate or revise, as is, as is the technical term, all those various provisions. For example, the Election Laws Amendment Act of 2000 had about 30-something or more provisions. We had to migrate them back to their respective homes, either in the, where appropriate, either in the ROPA or in the National Registration Act. So, Mr. Speaker, even without the amendments, this exercise has been great for our law revision process in that it has now, for the first time after approximately three decades, assembled all of all election laws and registration laws and related laws to those two processes. We are now putting them in their respective abode so they can be easily and conveniently accessed. Even if we have accomplished nothing more than that, I believe, sir, that we have accomplished a great lot. But these amendments go much further than that. Mr. Speaker, the bill that is before us is 63 pages in length. And the amendments that are contained therein are wide-ranging and they cover from the beginning to the end almost of the ROPA. It is therefore physically impossible for one to go through clause by clause in this bill. One will only have to deal with the conspicuous and salient aspects of the reforms that are being proposed. So, Mr. Speaker, the first component of the bill deals with the various sections of the Election Laws Amendment Act and 
to put to reside them at convenient places within the ropa. So you have a series of provisions here that we are now inserting into ropa as they are relevant to ropa, which were found or which are in the, 20, in the 2000 ELA, Election Laws Amendment Act. And we have done similarly for the National Registration Act. And they are all there, the establishment of the Permanent Secretariat. And these are all in the laws already. It is just to situate them appropriately. The clarifying of the commission powers over the commissioner. And importantly, Mr. Speaker, one of the main policies, and perhaps I should speak to the main policies of this bill. Let me digress a little to speak about the main policies of the bill. Mr. Speaker, ROPA is nearly 100 years old and by sheer passage of time would have required a review in any event. However, elections 2020 brought to light the way that the legislation in its current form can be subject to abuse. Mind you, this is the very legislation that governed all the elections, including 2015, which the joint opposition won and formed the government. It presented no problems for the returning officers working in that electoral machinery. It presented no problems for the very chief elections officer who administered the 2020 elections, both of those categories of officials and all others seem to have understood their functions quite well and performed them quite creditably. Come 2020, March the 2nd, election days, election day was well. President Granger, speaking on behalf of the government, lauded the activities of voting day. And so did all the political parties contesting the elections. So did all the major international observer agencies and local observer agencies observing D-Day activity, E-Day activities, or D-Day, whichever wish, E-Day, I believe. It was when the tabulation of Region 4 begun, then the mad orchestra began to play. Nine other regions tabulated their results and transmitted their statements of poll and the consequential legal documents to the center under the legislation without any significant complaint or difficulties. It was when the tabulation of Region 4 began that we saw a different story unfolding. And it gave us, and it gave the world, an opportunity to see how discretion can be abused, how discretion can be manipulated, how irrelevant considerations can contaminate the exercise of discretion. How ill motive, how fraud can contaminate the exercise of power. But it did not start there. It began before with an unlawful house-to-house -house exercise in 2019 where the GCOM wanted to scrap the existing database and construct a new one and carried out a house-to-house -house process which in record six weeks purported to register according to them over half of the electorate when we took a full two years 
in 2008, the last time such an exercise was undertaken to complete the entire country. What, it was, what was found out in that aborted house-to-house -house exercise was a clear and present intent to alienate a number of qualified persons to be registered so that you would have had a very limited and deficient base from the National Register of Registrants from which a voter list would have been extracted, thereby rigging an election even before it was called. That was the first problem that surfaced, quite apart from the unilateral appointment of the GCOM chair. I have to abbreviate my presentation to give you focus. So that was challenged in the court, and the court ruled, as we all know, that you cannot remove existing registrants from that database, especially, or rather specifically, if they were not resident in the country. Because that was the stated purpose of the exercise. To remove from the database persons whom GCOM felt had, are not resident in the country. And the rationale is simple. The combination of Articles 59 and 159 of our Constitution imbues to every citizen or imbue to every citizen of this country if power to register one that citizen is 18 years and over, one that citizen is a Guyanese, no mention of residency, meaning that if you are resident in Timbuktu, if you are resident in Sri Lanka, if you are resident in the United Kingdom, once you are 18 years and over and you are a Guyanese, you can come here and be registered. And once registered, you are qualified to vote. Very simple equation. Human beings. Very simple. So, Mr. Speaker, we had to then deal with that issue, and that is reflected in the amendments here, as well as in the amendments in the National Registration Act. Wherever residency, we have a duty as lawmakers to ensure that Article 8 of the Constitution is complied with. Article 8 of the Constitution says that any law that is inconsistent with the Constitution is void to the extent of that inconsistency. When we are making laws, we have to ensure, or amending laws, we have to ensure that those laws meet the constitutional litmus test. There are many instances in the current Registration Act and in the, in the ROPA when it relates to the compilation of the list of electors that place, rather misplace emphasis on residency. Wherever that has occurred, Mr. Speaker, it is now being removed to bring the legislation, both ROPA and the Registration Act, in conformity with the four corners of the Constitution. So that's a major thrust of these amendments. Second, Mr. Speaker, the public would be well aware that the Chief Elections Officer has a great unnecessary latitudinal width and breadth of power when it comes to the appointment of polling places. GCOM took a policy last election and possibly previous elections too. A policy I have no doubt was made with the best of intentions that they will use as far as possible only public places as polling stations. However, you have places in this country where there may not be a sufficient number of public places. Therefore, you have to, by necessity, to ensure that there is available voting stations for the electorate to exercise their franchise, you have to rent private places. What we found on the last occasion, not what we found, what we made public, was that areas in Georgetown, for example, where there are far more public places that could have been used for polling places, private residences were used. And in my constituency, 
on the east coast of Demerara, where there is a distinct paucity of public places, polling stations, sufficient number of polling stations were not appointed. When I queried, when we queried, the executive agent, election agent of the PUP, Comrade Zulfikar Mustafa, and I am an assistant election agent, when we queried it to, 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 to the then chief elections officer, he gave me that excuse that they are confined only to rent, to deal with public places. I traveled around Georgetown and I photographed over 15 private residences that are in close proximity with public places but those private residences were retained or rented and the public places were not being used. And I presented that to him. And I said, this cannot be fair. Then we had to take a team from the Elections Commission accompanied by APNU AFC. Basil Williams was part of that team. Uh, I can't remember who else. The consultants from the Commonwealth, myself, Mr. Zulfikar Mustafa and a team from GCOM because we had to travel to the East Coast to show the length of villages and to show where the polling places were located. Firstly, they were inadequate in number. They were not properly geographically located, so there was not an equitable spread, but quite apart from the geographic spread to make it convenient for voters, there was a minuscule number totally inadequate, totally inadequate to satisfy the voting population in localities. So that was a major problem. And what was even worse was that in Guyana, we must always recognize our problems as leaders. We know in Guyana at election times, there are peculiar problems because of the ethnic voting patterns. We know also that there is a propensity, there is a propensity sometimes for violence at election time. What we discovered in many areas, persons of one stronghold was taken from that and the list for which those persons were voted, were, were to vote, were located in a distant village causing them to walk miles or travel miles into a different constituency, a different constituency to cast their ballots. Clearly intended to expose the, our atmosphere to unnecessary tension and possibly combustion having regard to our history at election times and what is associated with that. Those were the things that we had to confront, so much so. Three days before elections, there were a number of big areas where the people did not know where they, they were going to cast their ballots because GCOM was still not. We had to go with torchlight, floodlight into dark areas of villages on the East Coast to identify open spaces because, and we accepted their explanation, they don't want to go to houses, and we accepted that. The next alternative, if you don't have a public building, is a public space. So we had to go with torchlight and find playground and empty house lots. And then GCOM had to get tents and equip them overnight for people to go and vote there the next morning. And I say without any fear of contradiction, as the leader of the opposition will say, the fear of successful contradiction, that there was a pattern. Uh, there was a pattern. And you know what the pattern was? Because we traveled both, both strongholds of the different political parties. Because the APNU AFC who was part of that exercise insisted that we go into areas such as Bachelor's Adventure, such as Victoria over the line, etc. And we went. And the position was not the same. They were not comparables. Only in the PPP perceived strongholds 
did we have these difficulties? So PPP elect, electorates or supporters didn't know where they were going to cast their ballot 48 hours before elections day. These provisions intend to address that. To, not to take away the power of the CEO. To circumscribe those powers. Regulate those powers. Insert into the law factors that he must take into account that before he chooses a polling station. And also there is a delimitation of numbers that can cast ballots at one polling station. So we don't have overcrowding. I have said repeatedly publicly, and I'm going to say it again. If anyone, and I've put out this challenge over a year now, and nobody has accepted it, and I hope that someone will try to do it tonight. If anyone can point to a single provision in these proposals, which create an electoral advantage for the PPP, I am prepared to stand up here and debate it, rather for any political party. The point I want to emphasize is that any single person who is concerned about free, transparent, and accountable elections in this country will support every single amendment here because they are all designed to bring clarity, to bring transparency, to bring accountability to the electoral machinery. That is all. Examine them. One by one I can go through. I may not have the time. But they are, they are all here. So, so let me go to the bills. To the bill itself now. So section clause 6 is amended. And that deals with the establishment of polling station. It says where no public a building is available to be appointed. The chief elections officer may rent a separate private building unconnected with a political party or politician and appoint it a polling place. How can you have a problem with that? How can you have a problem with that? A large polling place with adequate space may be divided into polling stations. No more than 400 electors to vote at a polling station. How can you have a problem with that? How can you have a problem with that? Factors to be considered in dividing a polling place into polling stations include, this is the circumscription or, or regulation of the discretion that I'm speaking about. One, the number of electors on the list. Two, the size of the polling place. Three, the availability of internal and external space in the polling place to accommodate, accommodate electors lining up at reasonable distance apart. Four, the accessibility of the polling place for persons with disability. How can anyone find this objectionable? And also, the chief elections officer, later in the bill, is mandated to give notice X number of days, I believe five days, before polling day, he has to publish the list of polling stations for all to see. How can that be wrong? There are, there's a provision, I believe, for last minute changes, but as far as possible, he has to publish the notice to poll, the list of polling stations in the official gazette for everyone to see. How can anyone concerned about transparent election find that in any way objectionable? Then, Mr. Speaker, we have the division of the polling districts into subdivisions and this is a direct answer to Claremont Mingo shenaniganism, a direct response to him. There's no two, three ways about that. We have countries in the world where millions and millions of ballots are counted and results are declared within a matter of days Weak sometimes, depending upon the number. We have a couple thousand ballots in Region 4 that took us from March to August to count and resolve. How much was the total ballots in Region 4? What was the total ballots in Region 4? A couple hundred, a couple tens of thousands of ballots. Out of 160,000 thereabouts. 
About 200,000, I'm told. It took us eight, six months to come that. It means, unfortunately, that we are unable to count 200,000 ballots properly, fairly, and in accordance with law. And that was on display at Ashmin's building. And the stories are now unfolding before the Commission of Inquiry to refresh our memories if it is becoming dull. So, we proposed Region 4 first, as that was the problem region, and no one can dispute. No one can dispute that as where the problem arose. Then, the, the opposition party said, the opposition party said that we are singling out Region 4 because it is their stronghold. We rejected that because there was nothing to do with stronghold and weak hole. It was where the problem arose. But we consulted, and I believe the private sector commission and some other electoral body came to us and said, look, just to appear even-handed, and we are, just choose another two regions or another region that is considered a, PNC, a PPP stronghold and do the same thing. We are motivated by no sinister motive and therefore we are unopposed to such a gesture if it can bring the opposition on board because we want the opposition to embrace these changes. After all, whether I like it or not, you are the major opposition of the country. I hope, I don't know how long that will remain so, but you are a major player in the electoral equation and therefore you must have a say. You, you have the support of a significant constituency in this country. So, so honorable members, what we did is what we were proposing originally for Region 4, we replicated it in Region 3, a known PPP stronghold, and in Region 6, a known PPP stronghold. So if there is any disadvantage by the subdivision, the PPP is suffering it more by 100%, because we have two and you have one. That is the extent that we are going to satisfy the queries that you have raised. So Region 3, Mr. Speaker, is now divided into three, and what we have done is not created unknown divisions. We used existing polling subdivisions within the polling districts. All of us who have done election work at election time would be familiar with the different regions and the polling subdivisions within the regions. All we have done is use those same boundary demarcation so that for GCOM, they will correspond with the existing electoral division system in, in their system. So there is not much, uh, there is not going to be much um, work for GCOM to do when they have to enforce this legislation. So Region 3 is divided as it is now divided, but in poll district, it is now divided into Esequibo Island and River Subdistrict. That's one. Two, St. Lawrence, Cordilla Ida Subdistrict. And three, Hague to Arabio Creek Subdistrict. Now, what this, what this amendment seeks to do is to replicate the identical structure which exists in the polling districts and to put them in sub-polling districts now, whereby you will still have a returning officer, but in each polling sub-district, you will have a supernumerary returning officer who, for all intent and purpose, will perform the very function that the returning officer would have performed for the entire region. So in Region 3, you will now have three tabulations being done instead of a tabulation being done in a central place. Each of these sub-districts will be tabulating their votes 
and they will be sending their documents straight on to the elections and all of that is outlined to the CEO, to the chairman of the election because we amplify the persons whom documents have to send to so that no one person will hold election documents at a ransom anymore and we'll also send it to the arrow and the arrow at the end of course they will have to tabulate the supernumerary uh, returning officer will tabulate in the same way that the arrow tabulated allowing all the election agents the observers etc to participate we specify how he must tabulate no bread sheet and spreadsheet but he must use the statements of poll he can project it on a on, a, on, a, on an electronic mechanism if he wishes but the basis of the tabulation must be the statement of poll and nothing but the statement of poll. If there is any transposition from the statement of poll, then it must be done in a transparent way and with the concurrence of all the participants in the process, the statutory participants, and they are listed there. And, and these aggregates, these aggregates, of these totals will then send to the RO who shall declare these regions these supernumerary council also they shall super, supernumerary returning officer also shall declare the RO shall declare as well so we have and then but I'm going to deal with that later so that is region three region four is East Bank sub district North Georgetown Subdistrict, South Georgetown Subdistrict, East Coast Damarara Subdistrict. And Region 6 shall be East Bank Barbies, the Kanji Subdistrict, Upper Quarantine Subdistrict, and Lower Quarantine Subdistrict. Right? So, so I, I hope that you understand what will happen there. Now, the SOPs are going to be sent to the CEO. And to the ROs and to the chairman of the commission. The ROs upon receipt must post on the, on the website. Must post on the website if the RO fails to do that. And he must do it upon receipt. So within 24 hours, all the SOPs should be on our website. Then the CEO, if there's a default on the RO, must also post to the website. So within 24 hours, all the results are known in the country. And of course, with the various duties that are being created here, if there is any breach of these duties, serious criminal offenses are created and high fines and high term of imprisonment are imposed. Discipline forces, when the discipline forces cast their ballots, then it is inked and that it's crossed off and that list is put into the ballot box and sent to the polling place where that person was registered to vote. So that's the guard against voters' impersonation. We clarify the position of identity papers and it's now stated what is acceptable as a form of ID, a valid passport is now acceptable. Any person who refuses to allow a voter to vote when that voter presents and a valid ID is also liable to some serious offenses. Any person who impersonates a voter is subject to a number of offenses as well. Anyone who obstructs voting day activities shall be liable for a series of offenses etc um, then of course we deal with how the votes are total clearly at the polling stations the amendments set out how the votes are to be counted who are to be present how the presiding officer must listen to the queries from the various persons and must sign off only when there is a consensus very transparent process of counting and then when the count is finished of course like what exists now the results a statement of poll is posted there at the con a conspicuous part of the polling place anyone 
who removes that statement of Paul also commits a serious offense. Mr. Speaker, also we deal with post-tabulation now and with the declaration of the results. And clear directions and guidelines are now set out to allow, well, rather to guide the chief elections officer on how to compute the results and how to aggregate and what he must count as valid votes and what will be the total results, which he will do in accordance with Section 96 to pass over to the Elections Commission for those to be the basis upon which the election results, the Election Commission will declare the results. Mr. Speaker, we have also mandated the CEO a time period once he is in receipt of all the aggregates numbers from the various regions, he has 12 hours, 12 hours to compute his results in accordance with Section 96. Honorable AG, as we are on time, you will need an extension of time to continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to ask that my colleague be given five minutes to conclude, please. Thank you, Honorable AG. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, he has 12 hours from the receipt of the documents and the numbers to calculate and give to the election commission. So he will not be operating, as the CCJ said, what was the word they use? Um, uh, he was, uh, they use a Western word in them cowboy movie. What was it? I can't remember. Yes, he was a lone wolf or something like that. Yes. Lone Ranger. That was it. I remember. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ramson. He's not a lone ranger and he doesn't operate on his own time frame. He now has a statutory mandate. And Mr. Speaker, there is a fine of $10 million and imprisonment for 10 years for breach of these obligations. Mr. Speaker, the elect... The, the, uh, the Election Commission publishes manuals, and I have no doubt that they do so with utmost bona fides to guide their election staff on election day on how to perform their respective functions. What we have found, and all, electioneering, all electioneers in this house will agree with me, that on election day sometimes when push comes to shove, crunch time, you have to argue with a presiding officer or some junior staff in the machinery about what the manual says or how the manual is being misinterpreted. Most times, Mr. Speaker, well, on every occasion, the manual ought to be in conformity with ROPA, the statutory code by which elections are conducted in this country. Sometimes the manuals collide with ROPA or sometimes they contravene Ropa. But to convince a junior staff on election day of that is an impossibility. They are following that guideline, that manual, like a Bible. And that can lead to problems. When you try to get onto a CEO or an RO, you have great difficulties. What we are stipulating now as a matter of law, that any manual that GCOM wishes to use, and they have the autonomy to use any number of manuals that they wish, they must make them public at a period of 30 days before, after proclamation. 30 days before election day, they must make those manuals public so that they cannot change them after making them public. And so that we have the time, all political parties have the time to scrutinize those manuals if, and find objections to them. Mr. Speaker, I am sorry that I have had to Hurry my presentation, as I said, it is impossible for one to cover the breadth and width of the amplitude and gravity and magnitude of the menu of proposals that are here. They are wide ranging. I know that there are many speakers after me who will speak, competent, experienced politicians 
in the election field and i have no doubt mr speaker that they will carry the baton on and further explain the various facets and tenets of this bill mr speaker this is a good piece of lawmaking which every sensible guyanese should throw their full support behind thank you very much mr speaker thank you very much honorable attorney general our next contributor 